much Nathan up there. All right, we got the thumbs up from the booth back there, so we are live. Welcome, internet, to Calvary Baptist Church. <laughs> Welcome, all you in person. Join us as we sing this morning. Stand and uh, worship the Lord. Uh, we went back into the archives this morning and pulled up some songs that we haven't done in a long time, so I hope you enjoy it. But please stand and join us. It, now is the time to worship. be seated. Welcome here uh, for all those that are in person on this beautiful rainy day um, and all those that are inside their own homes online as well. Uh, just a few announcements this, this morning. <clears throat> uh, first of all, we're continuing to look for more volunteers for our Blueberry Festival. Um, we are kind of ramping things up as it's getting close and close. Um, we're at like five weeks before Blueberry Festival, which is crazy. Um, so yeah, we're still looking for a few more people. If you're interested in VBS or helping with escape rooms or kitchen, um, we have the carnival on Sunday. We're doing the Awana Pinewood Derby cars, um, what we're excited about. Um, the other thing we're looking for, we're kind of trying to get going a little bit more now, is building for the people that are coming. So if you're interested in having a few people stay at your home, 
um, to bill at some of the people coming up from the states, um, please contact us or let us know. There's a table at the back for all those sign-up sheets um, that you can go to. Um, as well as at the table, there is more sign-up sheets for um, the trade show setup and teardown. So the trade show that usually happens during Blue Bay Festival that we've been helping set up for, for years now um, is now on July 20th um, to 23rd. So those are the two days that we will be setting up and tearing down, July 20th and 23rd. Um, and we have been asked to help again, and we are going to help again. Um, so please see Leanne or see that back table for more information. Um, and to sign up to help on those days with that. It's a great opportunity to serve our community in that way. I know they, they really love it when we do that. Um, other help that we need um, is continue to look for more volunteers to operate the camera and the live stream and proclaim up in our great new window up there. Um, so if you have um, any skills in that area or interest in learning, um, please come speak to Cheryl or me or um, Leanna Carter and we'd be happy to get you um, <coughs> Yeah, the training you need or plugged in in that area. We, we especially need help as we continue into the summer and lose some of our people that are up there um, to Camp of the Woods. So we're still pushing for more volunteers with that. Um, other announcements, uh, we have our Sunday School picnic today, which is very exciting. <coughs> so yeah, we are going out to Camp of the Woods. Um, some of this information should be in your bulletin. Uh, but we're going out to Camp of the Woods today after our morning service. I think on the bulletin it says 12.30. Uh, but we'll probably, be, a bunch of us will probably head out there right away. Um, so you can, you can head out whenever you are ready. Um, there's some information in your bulletin about what we have already. We have the burgers, the hot dogs, things like that. Um, and then condiments, buns, and then water. We're asking people to bring desserts or salads. Um, <coughs> in case you all need to know, which you, you would because it's raining outside, we do have a plan for indoors. Um, so there will be indoor spaces we can use. We have access to their gym and their lodge for different games and things. Um, so we'll be able to be indoors out of the rain, out of the bugs, even when it's not raining. Um, so it'll be good. Uh, yeah, uh, the other thing is for rides going out there. So just to kind of help people get rides that need rides, um, if you are planning on going um, and you have extra space, would you just raise your hand, please? Awesome. Now, if you don't have a ride, look at the people that have their hands raised and go talk to them. Uh, if not, you can just kind of ask around. I'm sure there'll be people going out that can give you a ride, um, and that'll make that all much better. Um, another just kind of our, our weekly announcements. The tithes and offerings um, are happening electronically. You can do that via calvarybaptistsue at gmail.com. Um, you can also place your offering in the back or take it up to the church office. Um, and then just weekly events, go groups happening on Mondays and Tuesdays. Um, the Tuesday morning prayer via Zoom at 7 a.m. You can see Don or Leanne for that link. Uh, the ladies' Bible studies are Wednesdays at 645. I believe this is their last one coming up, so they have one more week. Um, and then youth is no longer happening. Last week was our last week. It was great. We had a pizza party, had some, played some games, had some fun. Um, and we're excited for, for the fall and some of the things that we'll be doing this summer. So no youth until the fall. That is all I have. Carter will come up and pray. Well, very good. Well, I will continue on the announcements just a little bit. So, um, we have uh, coffee actually starting up next week. So, <laughs> some people are very excited about that. Others are like, nah, whatever. Well, there will be coffee at the back, we'll be serving, and we'll have our coffee time again. And so a little bit of fellowship uh, in the midst of our message, or our, our service in the morning. So I want to remind you of that and let you know that that is going to be happening. We have some very big news, and that is we have reached our refugee funding goal. So thank you guys so much. Thank you guys so much for your donations in that way. And so we have uh, reached that, and we are working on our paperwork. I had just spent about an hour and a half with the family this week on a FaceTime call, and so got to know them a little bit better, talked about how they're in the Word and, and how they're serving in their church, and uh, just finding out more about their daily lives. And so I uh, got to spend some time with them in that way. They're very excited and very hopeful. They have 
been doing their paperwork and getting all things done on their end, and they're soon ready to actually transfer that to us, make sure that it's all filled out properly, and then get their photos done and sign off on different things. And so we're very excited about all of this. Uh, so uh, praise the Lord that this is continuing to move forward, and we want to continue to pray for their safety. The, the challenge that they're facing is deportation, and what's been actually happening, uh, and one of the stories that was shared with me is their, some of their families in their church were taken to deportation camps, and then every morning the security come to them or, or the police force or whatever come to them and every morning they're on them about signing a piece of paper that says yes I want to go back home and they pastor them and pastor them and pastor them until they sign and so many of their um, many of their families from their church have been deported and unfortunately with some of them excited in their home church taking pictures and videos of what's been going on in their church some of the people in their home country have found those videos and when they arrive home there's immediate persecution and so we want to we want to be praying for them and and persecution means that there's actually imprisonment and and some people have actually uh, lost their lives and so we want to continue to pray for them in this way um, in regards to uh, prayer this morning those who know John Cole I regret to inform you that John Cole has passed away. Um, so John had a stroke last week and passed away, and we had just been notified of that this, this weekend. And so we want to pray for John's family. And so we'll pray for that. And also uh, a praise item. The Bates hit a moose last night, and they're okay. They're home. And so uh, we're just thankful that they're everything is all right and we'll get to see them later today and so see how how they fared out in that uh, our missionaries for this week are paul and joanne jansen working with ncem in edmonton so let's just take some time now and pray lord god we we acknowledge you as sovereign the creator of the heavens and the earth lord all that we know you are sovereign over and lord we praise your name Lord, you, by your grace through faith in Christ, have made yourself known to us. And Lord, we are able to acknowledge you in our days. The work of your Holy Spirit, the conviction and leading, the hope and the encouragement that we find in you alone. Lord, we praise you for these things. Lord, this morning we, we gather in your name. Lord, we desire your work to be done in our lives. Lord, we want to reveal you for your glory and your praise in this place. And so, Lord, we pray for your leading as we gather. We pray for your good work. And we pray for the sensitivity of what you are doing in our lives. And, Lord, that means denying ourselves. That means walking in your righteousness and revealing all that you have done and all that you are doing. Lord, may we be faithful in this and trust in you in this. Lord, we praise you and thank you for your hand of provision and safety. We think about the Bates, Lord, and as they've just been in an accident and, and yet they are safe, Lord, we praise you and thank you for that. And Lord, I know that this shakes people up and Lord, we just pray your continued provision and health and safety upon them. And Lord, we are thankful that we will get to gather with them today. Lord, we thank you that we have been able to reach our fundraising goal and support this family. And Lord, we pray for your encur continued encouragement, hope, strength, and safety and provision for them. Lord, we pray that they would go unnoticed in their community, in, their, in the country that they're in. And Lord, we pray that your hand of provision would be upon them as almost their whole family is working to provide for the home. Lord, would you bless them in their jobs? Would you bless them in their income? And Lord, may they continue to provide for 
what they need. Lord, may you be the provision of that. And Lord, we pray that they would be in a, a support and encouragement to their church to build one another up, to spur one another along. Lord, I pray that they would be faithful in reading and in prayer, growing in their understanding of you, and Lord, leading each other to you in all their circumstances. Bless them and keep them, Lord. Have your hand of safety and protection upon them. Lord, we want to pray for those who are struggling physically. Lord, Louie and Sherry and Eddie and Marion, for Doug, for Ronald. Lord, we pray your hand of safety. Even, even Paul in, in Parkinson's, Lord, we just pray that you would have your hand of grace and mercy upon these, Lord. And may they know your daily provision, your strength, your hope, and your healing. And Lord, as they read your word, I pray, and as they pray, I pray that they would be satisfied in you, that they would know all strength and encouragement. Lord, bless them and keep them. Lord, we, we want to lift up Paul and Joanne in their ministry in Edmonton and, and to those uh, First Nations in that community and in that area. Lord, may you bless them. Lord, bless them in relationship. Bless them in the truth of the gospel. And Lord, may they see people come to faith in Christ. May they see people being discipled and faithful to the call that you have placed upon their lives. Lord, we praise you and thank you for this morning. We thank you that we are able to come and serve and, and do so openly, revealing who you are and the work that you have done in our lives. And Lord, I pray that we as a church would be faithful in sharing the gospel. I pray that we would never hold back sharing the truths of who you are and what you are doing in our lives. Lord, I pray through our words and our actions that people in this community will hear and know the truth of who you are. And Lord, may we see fruit. Lord, we desire people to know you, not because we want them to attach themselves to us, but to walk in faithfulness to you, knowing the forgiveness of sins and knowing the hope that they have in your return. Lord, you are faithful and good. We praise your name this morning, Lord. Lead us as we now sing to you, Lord, in worship and in praise and in awe of who you are. We praise you and thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand and join us as we worship in song. Uh, these are the days of Elijah. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of the servant, days his righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and
special now so you may be seated and all the children can come on up yeah all the kids come on up here come on right up in the front row parents if your kids are nervous you can come with them it's a good story yep come on up we're going to continue our story of little pilgrim's big journey if you remember, we had met Christian, right? And he is going on a big journey. So we're going to continue that story today. All righty. So Christian had met um, the evangelist, and he had, Christian had something on his back. Do you guys remember what this was for those of you that maybe were here a month ago? He's got this burden on his back. Does anybody know what that burden might be? Well, it kind of looks like a rock, but what would it maybe represent? It represents, that's right, it represents the sin, the burden of um, Christian sin. And he also had something else in his hand, a book that he had looked at, and that's why he's even going on this journey. And do you know what that book represents? That's right. It represents the Bible. So let's find out what happens with Christian today. Christian asked Evangelist, do you think it's true? Will my city be destroyed? Is the celestial city real? Yes, said Evangelist. Every word of it is true. Can you see, Callan? Um, the, king, the king wrote it all, and the king never lies. Do you want to find the celestial city? Yes, Christian said, more than anything. Evangelist pointed in the distance. Can you see that light right there? 
follow it until you find the narrow gate. When you get there, goodwill will tell you what to do. Where do you think that celestial city is going to be? I'm not even going to give that away. You guys will have to always come back and listen to this story. What was that? <gasps> Do you think? I think you're right, Jason. I think it refers to heaven. Christian sprinted toward the light in the distance, right through the middle of town. People who saw him shouted, where are you going? Come back, Christian. Don't be a fool. Some laughed at him and called him names, and some were sad to see him leave. Christian didn't even look back. He just kept running and shouting, I want life, true life, eternal life. Two boys from the town named Obstinate and Pliable chased after him. Slow down, they yelled, wait for us. Obstinate, who was a stubborn and strong boy, caught up with Christian. He grabbed Christian by the arm and said, Come back right now. Don't be a fool. I'm not a fool, said Christian, and I can come back because you live in the city of destruction. But I seek an everlasting city. Please come along with me. You think Obstinate's going to go? No way, said Obstinate. I could never leave behind all my friends and all my stuff. Christian answered, the friends and pleasures you speak of can't compare to the joys I seek. I seek a treasure that can never be lost or stolen or broken. Read about it in my book. But, but Obstinate refused. Hush. I don't care about your book. Let's go home, Pliable. Christian has lost his mind. Don't make fun of him, Pliable told Obstinate. If what he says is true, I'd like to go with him. Obstinate laughed. Then you're just as much of a fool as Christian. Have fun searching for your imaginary city. He turned and went back. That's the end of that chapter. Now, you guys told me that the burden that's on his back is representing the sin, right? And the book that he, was, uh, he has is the Bible. But, and how did Christian respond to what he was reading in this book? Did you say something, Nehemiah? He's, he's agreeing with it, right? He's wanting to find out what this celestial city is all about. He's believing the Bible and the truth of the Bible. Yes, Sean. He's probably a little bit confused because he's not too sure. Should I go? Should I stay? I'm being made fun of by my friends because they're calling me a fool. But do you think he's going to continue on his journey? I think so. I do. Okay, we're going to pray, and then you guys can go back to your moms and dads. Dear God, I just thank you for each one of these boys and girls here this morning, and I just thank you for the story of Christian and how um, he's just believing in what he's reading in the Bible, and he's having the faith to follow through with what it says, um, even though there's going to be many challenges on this big journey of his that he's taking, and I just pray that each one of these boys and girls here will also believe what they read in the Bible because, God, your words are true. You are the king, and we know that what we read in the Bible we, is true and that we need to believe it. And I just pray that these boys and girls every day will, will just um, continue to believe that and learn to grow and love you more each and every day. I pray now that you'll just be with them today. Help us all to have fun at the Sunday school picnic and for the rain to stop so that we can enjoy the great outdoors. I just pray this in your name. Amen. All right, you guys can all go back. All right, very good. Uh, 
join us again in the final song here before uh, the preaching of the word. Please stand and join us in How Great Is Our God. morning for how great you are and that you've reminded us again through song and through um, stories and through prayer that you are a great God. We look to you as you speak to us this morning through the giving of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I'm thankful for this opportunity to teach from the Word this morning, recognize a few faces that might not have been here for the entire series. So we've been going through a series in 1 Thessalonians, and just to catch us up, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar or haven't been here for the rest of the letter, uh, this is a letter Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. That was a major city, picture Toronto or Calgary, 
uh, in the Roman Empire. It was a major trade route, and they were under the Roman Empire. And so when Paul and his companions came there and started preaching that there's another Lord, Jesus is Lord, uh, that caused chaos in Thessalonica because their good standing for the flourishing of this city, they needed to be submitted to Rome. And if you know anything about the Roman Empire, they had a Caesar, and he was Lord. It was not uncommon for the Caesars of the Roman Empire to actually ascribe divine status to themselves. There was emperor worship, or you could say Caesar worship, that took place. And so for another Lord to be proclaimed in this city, uh, they wanted to quiet that. You know, let's take care of this. Let's shut these people up because we don't want Caesar to get mad and then stop treating us well was the idea. Um, Paul, for some reason, wasn't there when the big mob came together and was looking for who's preaching this, let's get him. And so they actually grabbed this guy named Jason, put him in prison for a short while and re required a bond to get him out. Paul realized, I don't have much of a chance to keep preaching here or I'm going to be in prison. So he actually escaped at night and went on his missionary journey. But he always was thinking about the Thessalonians because when he preached the gospel to them, many of them believed. And so he was thinking, Oh no, is this, is this persecution snuffing out their faith? You know, have they, have they abandoned the faith because they didn't want to be like Jason and end up in prison? And so we always longed to go back to them, but for different circumstances, he wasn't able to. And so after a while, he sent Timothy, uh, his co-laborer, to go and see, is their faith still alive? And Timothy came back and gave a good report. And so Paul wanted to write them this letter, both thanking God that their faith had survived and also instructing them in various things. And so in chapter 4, that's kind of where Paul begins a large, large section of instruction um, that we're going to be in. He started off instructing them, saying, you know, keep walking in the ways we've told you. Um, when it comes to your bodies, you know, abstain from sexual morality. This was a very sexually immoral city. A lot of their different gods involved uh, sexual worship. And so he said, don't take part in any of that. Abstain from that. You know, God's given you his spirit to help you in this. Be pleasing to God in your body. And then he also wanted to instruct them when it came to the coming of the Lord, the second coming, um, which is also the same thing as the day of the Lord. They had heard different things. There were some concerns that maybe those who had died previously to Jesus' second coming somehow would have missed out. And so Paul's instructing them, no, don't worry. Everyone will be with the Lord on that day. Those who have died will actually be taken up first. And then we who are still alive when he returns We'll go and we'll all be together with him. So now my text for this morning is going to be in verse 12 and 13. So this is kind of the last paragraph of instructions Paul has for the church before he kind of gives these last few little statements. Um, so let me read that now. Starting in verse 12, it says, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. So back in chapter 4, when he started this section of instruction, he said, finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus. So Paul's doing this again. This asking is kind of an appeal to them. Picture a father with his, you know, children, the way he might ask them to do something. I have young kids right now, you know, three and one and a half, and so I don't do very much of this. I'm more in command mode all the time. Nehemiah, no touch. Lincoln, come. <laughs> Stay in your bed. That's the way you talk to young children, but that doesn't go over so well with your teenagers. I haven't been a father of teenager, but I was a teenager one time, and I know if my dad walked around the house, Marshall, no touch. <laughs> he would be overbearing, and I wouldn't feel very much... Uh, you could say respect, or I would just wouldn't enjoy that. It would, be much, it would go over much better for my dad to say, hey, Marshall, can you please not touch that? You know, you know, picture a DVD or something, like getting my fingers all over it. Like, Marshall, please don't touch the back of the DVD, because then when I go to, to watch my movie, it's going to be smudged and it won't work. So fathers do this, parents do this all the time. They ask their kids to do things. Now, if I disobeyed my dad after he kindly, politely asked me to do something, then I'm going to get a lot more of the, you know, Marshall, I told you not to do that. But at least starting out, Paul wants to appeal to them in this more polite, uh, approachable manner because he wants them to understand that he cares for them. You know, he already said, I was with you like a nursing mother early in this letter. 
So Paul really does have this parental concern for the church in Thessalonica. So he says, brothers, we ask you to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. So before we get into this, this verb and this idea of what did Paul mean to respect them, let's ask the question, who is Paul talking about? Those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Uh, if you look at the way Paul wrote this sentence, kind of the grammar of it, you know, you have to go to the Greek language to do that because that's what re- Paul wrote in. There's only one possible solution, and that is that Paul had one group in mind. The way he wrote the sentence, it's as if he said those who are uh, laboring, kind of being over or ruling and admonishing. So it's not possible that Paul in his mind meant three different groups. You know, each group kind of the group that labors and the group that is over you and the group that admonishes. He had one group in mind. We can see that by the way Paul wrote. And so let's, let's think, you know, who does the Bible say does all three of these things? They labor, they are over the church, they're being over, and they admonish the church. Um, the only group that fits that description, especially when it comes to being over the church, is the, t- the title we use is elders, pastors, overseers. Those are the three words that the New Testament uses for this group. And the New Testament is clear that the elders are the ones who rule or are over the church. In 1 Timothy 5.17, this was Paul writing to Timothy, who was also, you know, in Thessalonica and, and might have taught similar things. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. So there you have that same idea of rule. It's not a very common word today, you know, especially in, um, I don't know, different governmental systems where we have a little bit more democracy and, and those types of ideas. We're not used to, like, being told, you know, this person rules you, but um, under monarchies and different systems in the world, the idea of ruling is a more common idea. We don't have to think of it as a negative. You know, you can obviously have good rulers and you can have bad rulers. Ruling itself is not a bad thing. It's more of the manner in which they do it. And this ruling in the church um, is supposed to be, you know, given honor. First, that's First Timothy 5.17 tells us. Um, so that's a similar idea to this text, but we'll look at that in a minute. Another text I want us to briefly look at just to firm up this idea that the elders are the only ones who are doing this being over the church is 1 Peter 5, 1 through 5. Peter writes and says, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. So that's where the word pastor comes from. Pastor is actually Latin for shepherd. So we could call Carter, Shepherd Carter, but... Um, for whatever reason, pastor from the Latin kind of became the Christianese word for this elder shepherd role, but it would actually be just as correct biblically to say, you know, shepherd so-and-so is pastor so-and-so, because that's literally what the Latin word means. Um, <clears throat> poimen is the Greek for this shepherd uh, title. So shepherd the flock of God is among you, exercising oversight. So there it is, that word over. So being over involves oversight. So you're seeing what's going on in the church and you're overseeing, you're, you're providing uh, management, you're providing care, you're providing direction. All those ideas are within oversight. Not in compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being example to the flock. So like I said, uh, being over a body itself is not bad. It's more the manner in which someone would do it would be bad. So like a domineering manner is not good. So Peter's telling the elders that he's writing to, don't domineer over those in your charge, but be examples to them. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So this is where all shepherds, all little s shepherds, should get their kind of example from. The big shepherd. Who's that? Jesus. He said, I am the good shepherd. You know, um, he is the big shepherd over the church. So every local church, even though Jesus is not here physically walking among us, he is the head. He is the big shepherd over every church. But we cannot see him. Uh, We have his word, but God also wanted human shepherds. Although they're not perfect like Jesus, they still do things that Jesus did when it comes to shepherding and 
overseeing. And so this is the way God designed his church for little S shepherds to all realize we're under the big S Jesus shepherd, um, but we're still going to carry out this role in his absence. 1 Timothy 2, 12 through 13, again, Paul, in the same letter to Timothy, is um, writing something that has to do with this idea of, of elders. He says, I do not permit a woman to teach. So think about like what I'm doing right now. Or to exercise authority over a man. So again, being over, it's an issue of authority. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. So, you might think, why are only men to be elders? That's what that verse says. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise the authority of a man. Paul gives this reason. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. So it's not because men are smarter. It's not because uh, men are of more value or worth. No, we're equal in worth and value before God. And there's women who have studied the word and can explain it or teach it better than men. So it's not an issue of intelligence or the ability to teach. It's purely because God created Adam first, and then he created Eve to be his helper. And that's the, the design, the creation order we see not only in the church, but also in the home. You know, Paul's teaching is also clear. The sermon's not about that, so we're not going to get into that. But the man, the husband, is the head of the home. And similarly, men who are also heads of the home are also going to be heads of the church. So, this is kind of three texts that give us a framework for this idea of elders, who they are and what their role is that Paul had in mind when he was writing to the Thessalonians. But let's ask one more question. Why didn't he just say elders? You know, why does he give this threefold description instead of saying, respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you? Wouldn't it have been easy if they had some of this teaching to just say elders, and especially, here's another point, or another thing to take note of, um, elders is not a new Christian thing, it actually is a continuation of Judaism. So elders uh, were kind of always there in Judaism, but especially uh, during the time of Moses, we're actually told in Numbers 11, 16 through 17, that the Lord said to Moses, gather for me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting, and let them take their stand there with you, and I will come down and talk with you there. And I'll take some of the spirit that is on you, on Moses, and put it on them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with you, so that you may not bear it alone. You may not bear it yourself alone. So since the days of Moses, God, this was not a man's idea, this was God telling Moses, don't do this alone. You have this huge nation this is too much of a burden for one man to lead this. I want to take the spirit that I put on you and put it on others. So gather 70 men, and I'm going to anoint them with the same spirit that you have so that they can help bear this leadership with you. So different uh, communities and cultures in the world still have this idea of elders. As I've been here in Sioux Lookout and gotten to know the Ojibwe or the Cree cultures, this is a very uh, prominent thing in their culture. Like They have elders, men and women, um, and they're very honored and respected. They get the best seat at the feasts. Um, you know, they'll often be asked to pray before the meal or pray after a meal. You know, I grew up in Washington State. We didn't have elders. You know, we had elderly. Uh, but, you know, different cultures have kind of lost that idea, and different cultures retain that idea. But in Israel, it was similar to the Ojibwe or Cree culture in that they had elders. And I think it's possible that they were men and women, um, similar to the Ojibwe culture. I don't know for sure. Uh, but God said specifically, gather for me the men. So again, that just uh, aligns with God's creation order that he wanted the men to bear this burden of leadership in Judaism. And then this continued all the way until the time of Jesus. So when Jesus was teaching at one point, he had just cleaned out the temple uh, either days or yeah, probably days before this. And then he's in the temple teaching. He had just, you know, if you remember that story, come in and just driven those who are selling, um, doing inappropriate things in the temple out, you know, with this great, you know, righteous anger. And so the elders and the chief priests come up to him, Matthew 21, 23, and they say, by what authority are you doing these things? And 
who gave you this authority? And then their mind, they're thinking, because we didn't, and we're the authority here. Like, we're the ones, you know, back with Moses, we're the ones that God's given authority. We're the elders. Like, who are you? How dare you come in to the temple of God and do these things you've been doing? Obviously, they didn't believe and didn't realize that this is the son of God, so he has authority over everyone. Um, but that's kind of why they were questioning him that way, because they're like, we're the authority figures. God's actually given us this authority. We didn't approve you, so what are you doing in our temple um, pushing people around? And so, <clears throat> so since the elders were the respected heads of households and leaders in Judaism, the apostles continued to use this title. They didn't invent something new. It's just a continuation since Christianity, um, Jesus, is the continuation of the Jewish faith. So back to, so just keep that in mind, back to why didn't Paul just say elders? Clearly it was known what elders were, even if the Thessalonian culture didn't have it, you know, you still had Jewish believers in the church, they would have known exactly what an elder was if Paul had said, respect your elders, why does he name them? I have a couple ideas. One possibility is that just the title is not the important thing to Paul, it's the role. So instead of just saying elders, he wanted to give them this threefold role to help them think about, you know, don't just think about an elder as a guy with, that's been given the title, but think about the men in the congregation who are doing these three things. These are who I want you to recognize as your elders, whether they've been officially recognized or not. So that's one idea. The other one is that it's not, we're not, uh, we haven't been told, we don't know for sure whether actually Paul got around to appointing elders himself. So it's possible that because of the big mob that kind of kicked Paul out of the city, so to speak, you know, he realized, okay, I can't keep preaching here. I'm going to be in prison in a minute. Let me escape. Maybe he didn't get around to appointing elders himself because that was his normal practice. Most of the churches Paul planted, he would have appointed elders himself. So if he didn't have time to do that, maybe that's also why he didn't use the word elders here and he wants the Thessalonians to do this work himself. But like I said, scripture is silent on that, so we're not going to make the argument based on that. Whether or not Paul appointed the elders himself, Let's say he did, like it was his normal practice in other churches. Eventually, Paul's going to be dead, and the elders are going to be dead. You know, give it 50 years, they're all dead. The church is still going to have to appoint their own elders, and so this threefold description is going to help both the church in Thessalonica and then every other church in the world like us who are reading Paul's letter, God's inspired word, to recognize, you know, who should be elders. So Paul's kind of saying, look for these three things. So now let's look at the verb. Um, to respect. What did Paul mean when he said that, that he wanted them to do with those who labor among them and are over them and admonish them? The ESV says respect. The King James Version says to know them. The NASB New American Standard Bible says to appreciate, and it has a footnote that says the Greek word means to know. And so I was like really digging into this, you know, over the last couple of weeks, like Okay, what is the meaning? Because these are not the same. To know and to respect and to appreciate are not the same thing. So, like, which one is it? And I was just, you know, praying and studying. God, help me to understand this. Reading commentaries, looking at different English translation, translations. And in my study, I found out that the ESV actually translates this exact same word with the same parsing, which just means the exact same figure of speech, um, 11 different times where it shows up in the New Testament. Every time the ESV translators chose the English word know or understand, except here. Here they chose respect. So, you know, the work of translation is always trying to figure out what did Paul mean and how do I say that in English so that it means the same thing. And so, you know, 11 times they thought, okay, Paul says this word and it means know or understand, but here they thought it means respect. Um, but as I was, you know, okay, which one's right? Reading commentaries, um, the pillar commentary, which Carter has referenced, the author Green made the argument that he thinks it means more the idea of know or recognize um, for these two reasons. Paul says something similar in 1 Corinthians 16, 15, where he's writing to the Corinthians, ending his letter there, you know, kind of similar point in the letter at the end is here, and he says, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves, devoted themselves to the service of the saints be subject to such as these and to every fellow worker and laborer. And so, same word, Paul is saying, like, you know this. You've seen it. You know Stephanus. You've seen his labors. You know, he was the first convert. Be subject to him. 
So that's the same idea there. So that kind of gives uh, some, some weight to the idea that that's probably what Paul also meant here. And then, um, yeah, before I explain one more thing, let me say that, like, we actually use this word in the same way. So I was thinking about this word, and, you know, you know, and I thought, okay, I would, I would talk like this. So my sister comes to Sioux Lookout. She was here, like, two weeks ago, and we're going to, like, take our kids to the playground. And I'm like, hey, you want to go to this playground? And she's like, yeah, sure, which one? And I'm like, uh, that one, or the playground's next to that hotel with all the flooding, you know, the one you saw when you drove in. And she's like, oh, yeah. Okay, when she says, yeah, like, yeah, I know that hotel, she doesn't mean, oh, I intimately know that hotel like I know a friend. Like, she's never been there. All she did is drive by and see the hotel with all the flooding. But she means, like, I saw it. I noticed it. I re yeah, I recognize that hotel, like, the one with all the flooding. So that, I think, is the idea of what Paul's saying with this word. It's like, you know, the men that you see doing these things, you know, doesn't mean you intimately know them like a friend, um, although that's not a bad thing to get to know the others in that way. But it's more like, yeah, you know, you notice. You know, notice comes from the word know. You notice them doing these things. So that's the idea, the thrust of what Paul was telling the Thessalonians to do. Notice these men. Recognize them among you when they're laboring, when they're over you in the Lord, when they're admonishing you. Paul expected these men to be there, whether or not he had the time to actually recognize them himself and appoint them or not. You know, because like if I said, if he got kicked out of town too quickly to do that himself, um, he expected them to be there because Ephesians 4 um, teaches us that God has gifted um, certain men to the church. It says, he, Jesus, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds. Oh, that's that shepherd, pastor, elder, overseer, um, office, and teachers. So that can be combined <clears throat> shepherd teacher kind of the same thing to equip, equip the saints for the work of ministry for the building up of the body of Christ so unlike choosing a replacement for Judas to be the 12th apostle where they just cast lots Paul did not appoint elders in that way it wasn't like okay eeny meeny miny mo," or cast lots it was like I'm looking at the church I'm seeing the men that are doing these things and then I'm saying, yes, they have this gifting from the Lord. So this is not a man-made thing. Yes, seminary and different things can help men grow in these giftings. But literally, the elders, this shepherding, teaching gift is a gift. Um, it's not something that men just conjure up or, you know, like I said, learn this skill set. There's actually this divine gifting um, that God, that Christ um, gives to cause these shepherds, these teachers to be. So Paul expected that to be there, and that's what he wanted the church to look for. <clears throat> Before I became a missionary, a veteran missionary told me that the way to know you'll be a good missionary in the future, even though you're not right now, is if you're doing the types of things that missionaries do right where you are. So at that time, I was living in California, and um, I would drive like three hours sometimes through Los Angeles traffic, which is some of the worst traffic in the world to get to this little refugee English teaching center in a part of Anaheim where there was refugees from Iran and Iraq and all these different uh, Muslim countries because I had a heart to be a missionary at that time to Muslims. And so I had never been told you're a missionary. No one was paying me a single dollar to do this, but I was doing the work because I had this desire and you could say this, you know, equipping or this gifting from God. So that's what Paul is wanting the church to recognize um, there's going to be men in the congregation among you who are doing these things, even if I or no one else has appointed them and given them the title yet. And so that's who I want you to be looking for. Because at the end of the day, if the only reason I do missionary work is because someone says you're a missionary and I'm going to pay you to do it, that's not probably going to pan out. You know, it's going to get hard. The money ain't worth it. You know, um, why would I keep doing it? But if my motivation is this kind of desire God's given me or a gifting God's given me, then that's going to continue whether or not the title's there, whether or not anyone, you know, appreciates me for it and whether or not I'm getting paid for it. <clears throat> so let's dig in just a little bit into these three words just so we have a good idea of what Paul meant. I've already explained a little bit of kind of the overseeing one, but I haven't talked much about the laboring or the admonishing, so... 
The three things Paul said to look for men doing, laboring, overseeing, and admonishing, let's look at them. To labor, <clears throat> that could be, uh, you know, not necessarily an extreme word, but if you look into what the word Paul used, it actually means to toil. The same word is used in the Gospels when Jesus had told the uh, disciples who had fished all night, says they had toiled all night to put the net on the other side. So like literally they did not sleep that night. They worked all the night through. And Jesus says, hey, put the net on the other side. And Peter says, master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. But at your word, we'll do it. And as you know, the, the boat has so many fish, the thing's literally sinking because Jesus is Lord of the entire sea. So that word toil, or this word labor, is actually a toiling unto weariness. It's not just, you know, labor can mean that, the way we use it, but I think toiling gets at the idea of, like, just excessive labor. It doesn't take long to be in the church to find out that men, you know, who are given this calling and, and gifting do work this hard. That's why they have to take these things called sabbaticals or, um, what's the other word? Uh, anyways, that's a good word, a sabbatical to like take a rest. Like I am so worn out. If I don't take this couple months rest from doing this labor, I literally will have health problems and my adrenal gland will just explode and I might die. <laughs> so obviously I'm being a little extreme there, but um, you know, the ministry of shepherding the church can be extremely exhausting because unlike other jobs where you punch in eight to five, you're on call all the time. Um, and, you know, we're talking about eternal things here that just weigh on shepherds' hearts. And so, um, yeah, just an excessive labor that they do for the church. Charles Spurgeon says this, If by excessive labor we die before reaching the average age of man, worn out in the master's service, then glory be to God. We shall have so much less of earth and so much more of heaven. So sometimes, you know, our, our kind of, care ideas, while not wrong, might miss, you know, at least what Spurgeon thought, which was, um, you know, don't, don't care about your rest and your health so much, um, but actually be okay with just excessive labor, even if it means you die earlier because, hey, you'll be in heaven that much longer. Um, he also said this in lectures to my students, which was his book on kind of the pastoral ministry training young men. It is our duty and our privilege to exhaust our lives for Jesus. We are not to be living specimens of men in fine preservation, but living sacrifices whose lot is to be consumed. And so, you know, obviously you can take this too far and, you know, um, just completely fry your body and, you know, your ability to be a shepherd through overexhaustion. But Spurgeon, at least, um, seemed totally okay with the idea that it is actually part of part of the, uh, the sort of the labor of the shepherd or the pastor um, to be worn out. Um, so Paul might have thought the same thing. An elder that's been gifted by God is not going to be doing it for the money. They're not going to be, you know, lazy, just what can I get out of this? They're going to be working hard. I would say even the hardest workers in the church because God has given them this drive for this good work. In addition to working hard, Paul wanted the church to notice those who are over them in the Lord. This idea of being over, I've talked about it a little bit, but let me add this one other idea is, is presiding over, kind of like a judge presides over a courtroom. Um, the title overseer that Paul uses as a synonym for shepherd or uh, elder does literally have the idea of judgment associated with it. Um, I think someplace, I can't remember where, Jesus is kind of talked about as like the overseer in the sense that like he's going to be the final judge. And so this is what good leadership does. It oversees the church. Again, not in a harsh, domineering way, but in a, I want to care for you. I want to create order here. I want to make sure things are, are managed well. And especially when it comes to the teaching, like I'm keeping a watch, Paul told Timothy, keep a watch on the teaching, um, on yourself and the teaching, for, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. So that's one of the primary ways these shepherds, these elders, are overseeing the church is what's being taught. Is it good food or is it rotten food? You know, is it, is it the gospel or is it a false gospel? Is it sound doctrine or is it false doctrine that needs to be rebuked? 
Um, and so that's a main part of the oversight, but also you could say this presiding over, you know, kind of that judge picture does come into play when you have a dispute. You know, Paul, in one of his letters, can't remember the, which one off the top of my head right now, but there was these two women, Syntyche and Claudia, I think were their names. They had some sort of big beef. And Paul is saying, please agree in the Lord. Obviously, he was writing a letter, but if he was there in person, he might have gone and, and met with them individually or together and kind of done this, you know, uh, mediator role. So that can be kind of part of this idea as well, helping there to be, you know, harmony in the body. While the church has one head, Jesus, um, you know, you can also think about that uh, analogy as like these, these uh, elders are heads of the church. Again, little h heads, if Jesus is the big head. Um, but I think that's a helpful analogy because think about, you know, your body. Who cares for your body the most? Is it your hand or is it your head? You know, I don't know how all the brain waves and stuff work, but this morning it was your head that told your food or your hands to make the food if you ate breakfast and then put it in your mouth and your brain told your mouth to chew and subconsciously it tells your body to do good things with the food and so it's your head that, that really cares for your body the most and that leads your body and that oversees everything else about your body so that's what these men are to be doing for the church they're to be feeding and nourishing it not at the expense of the body but for the good of the body And men who are gifted as these overseers will have a concern for the entire church. You know, Paul uses that uh, body analogy and says some parts are less desirable, they deserve greater honor. So pastors, shepherds, elders that have been gifted by God are going to care for the entire church. They're not just going to have like, you know, their little buddy-buddy club. Um, you know, these are the guys that they kind of pour into, but then the rest of the church gets left to the wayside. No, they're going to care for the entire church, you know, even those they don't know as well. Um, even women, even children, the shepherds are going to care for everything in the entire church, all the different members. The third thing Paul says is to notice is admonishing. That's not a word we use very much anymore, um, but it means to bring correction, specifically to instruct someone like in the way they sh should go. So it's not just teaching, but it's like a, a persuasion, a kind of the warning aspect of like, you know, you're going this way, kind of like when Paul was telling them um, to abstain from sexual immorality. You could say that was like an admonishing, like he probably knew that some of them maybe even had partaken of sexual morality or they were being tempted to. And it's like, don't go that way, you know, go this way. Admonishing is not for those who love the praise of man. Um, you know, it takes a, a courage. I remember I was listening to this podcast last week. Um, didn't plan on this. It's just kind of a podcast I normally listen to, but the episode was on admonishment, and it's called Disciple Making Parent by Chap Bettis. It's a good one. And the guy was talking about admonishment because he's a pastor, and he said sometimes when he would have to have these hard conversations, you know, and admonish someone in private because, you know, let's say there was sin in their life that was clear and they were not, um, you know, confessing or repenting at all, just kind of they were just practicing sin, and they were claiming to be a brother in the church, and he needed to admonish them. He would, you know, pray and prepare to go, but in that moment of like, okay, now's the time to go meet with them or to kind of say what I know I need to say because I love them, he would feel sick to his stomach. So I just want to share that because I don't think I've ever heard that talked about. I've experienced it a few times, you know, and needing to have one of these hard conversations, but like, yeah, if you, whether you're an elder or you're just a church member who loves, you know, one of the brothers and sisters in the church, and God lays it on your heart to go talk to them about something, dealing with their life. And, you know, this isn't the case where, you know, you're the, the guy with the two by four sticking out of your forehead trying to point out someone else's speck. But you're like, you're doing it in love. Um, you know, this is something that, you know, you yourself have received grace from God in. And you want them to receive the same grace. And you're like, I'm trying to help you. I fear for you because if you continue in this, you could perish. Um like a serious thing, and you have this like sick stomach or sweaty hands or dry mouth or whatever it is, don't think that like, oh, I shouldn't do it because God hasn't given me this like total peace or something. Um, just from that guy's experience of my own, I would say you might always have those symptoms, those uncomfortable things, because what you're doing is uncomfortable. And so kind of like that idea, weep with those who weep. Um, the Bible teaches like it's kind of fitting to have these uncomfortable emotions because 
what we're, what we're going to talk about is uncomfortable. It's not a good thing. You know, sin is uncomfortable. It could also, of course, have to do with just our own love for people to like us. And so if we're going to go kind of bring admonishment to someone, we know they might not take it well. They might turn on us. Um, they might criticize us. They might say, how dare you judge me or whatever. Um, yeah, we could also just kind of be sick because we're like, oh, no, they're not going to like me like I want them to. So I'm not saying it's only one thing, but, um, yeah, just, like, be encouraged that if you feel like this is one of the hardest things I've ever had to do, but I think God wants me to do it, like, just uh, persevere in that. Obviously, pray and check your motives, um, but God wants shepherds, um, specifically based on this text, to be admonishing the church. That can be coming from here, kind of like an entire church admonishment. It can also be in those more private conversations. So there you have it. That's the three things. Those are the men that Paul wanted the church to recognize, to notice. And now, what does he say? After you notice them, what does he say to do? Starting in verse 13, he says, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Esteem, this word comes from, or this idea comes from the word estimate. You hear estimate, esteem. And this is the idea that like, you're, you're kind of attributing a value to something. So, you know, if someone is going to, like, estimate how much is that house worth, they're going to, like, size it up and see the ins and outs of it and then, you know, estimate what they think the value is. So Paul's saying estimate or esteem these elders, these, these uh, laborers who are over you and admonishing you of very high worth, very highly in love, super abundant would be the idea of extreme worth. Now, we should ask, is Paul saying to do this? Because really, they're not, but, you know, kind of like, I don't know if you've ever played youth sports, like everyone gets a trophy, even if, you know, you're the losing team. Like, oh, we'll just pretend that you're also the winner. Is that what kind of the idea of Paul's saying? Is like, just treat them very highly, even though they're really not that uh, much worth? I don't think so. I think Paul is saying this because these shepherds, these pastors, these elders of the church are of extreme value. Think about what they do. They keep the church on the narrow way. They make sure the church is being fed good food and not rotten food. They admonish us if we, if we veer off, you know, at the peril of our own soul. They say, brother or sister, don't do that. Please look, at, look to the word. What does the word say to do? Look to Christ. What could be of more value than this? Um... Yeah, the, the Christian life is not an individual thing. God has given us each other, and God has given elders to the church to help us all make it to the celestial city. And so this is of extreme value for these elders to be overseeing us, to be laboring among us to the point of exhaustion, and to be admonishing us to keep, to keep on the narrow way, to keep looking to Christ, to keep walking in the light and walking in love. So that's why Paul says, estimate them, esteem them of very high value because that is literally what they are worth. And he says, do this in love. Love is the greatest virtue. It's the golden rule. While Jesus didn't use the words golden rule, just the idea, like, the perfect rule. If you were going to say, okay, one rule, one sentence that would change the entire world, that would make the entire place perfect, what would you say? Jesus says, do unto others as you would have them do to you. Or one word, love. And so this is the idea that Paul wants uh, the church to be treating these men with. Like, you know, let's get real practical for a second. Do you like receiving a gift? Most of us do. Like, maybe buy the elders a gift. Do you like being affirmed? Like, hey, I see you doing this well. Like, good job. Or, like, praise God for that uh, grace in your life. Well, affirm your elders um, do you not like to be criticized for petty things yourself? You know, things that don't really have to do with anything, you know, uh, crucial or, it's, you know, it's not a sin thing, but it's just like, oh, I don't like the way he does that, you know. Do you like people talking about you that way? No, so don't talk about your elders that way. Don't be the grumbler that Charles Spurgeon speaks of when he says, <clears throat> sometimes it is the way the preacher speaks which is hauled over the coals. Here again is a dime field for fault finding. For every bean has its black, and every man has his failing. I never knew a good horse which had not some odd habit or other, 
and I never yet saw a minister worth his salt who had not some quirk or oddity. Now these are the bits of cheese which cavaliers smell out and nibble at. This man is too slow, another too fast. The first is too flowery, the second is too dull. Dear me, if all God's creatures were judged in this way, we should wring the dove's neck for being too tame, shoot the robins for eating spiders, and kill the cows for swinging their tails and hens for not giving us milk. Fault finding is a dread, dreadfully ca- fault finding is dreadfully catching. One dog will set a whole kennel howling, and the wisest course is to keep out of the way of a man who has the complaint called the grumbles. The worst of it is that the foot and mouth disease go together, and he who bespatters others generally rolls in the mud himself before long. The fruit of the spirit is love, and this is a very different apple from the sour Siberian crab apple which some people bring forth. So I know I can be rebuked by that, like, you know, just thinking critical thoughts of elders or others in the church. Oh, why does he preach like that? Or, oh, why does he do that? Or, you know, we want everyone to be like us. But if we really love them, and if we do what Scripture tells us to do, which is to esteem them of high, of high worth in love, we should just, yeah. I'm not saying you're never going to have those thoughts come in your mind, but just kill them. Like, be done with that. Don't, don't pick at and criticize um, your elders or anyone else in the church for these piddly little things Um, because it's not loving and it's not going to create esteem for them in your heart. And lastly, as we come to this last phrase here, um, Paul says, and be at peace among yourselves. In the context or the flow of thought, you know, you could wonder, does he mean this kind of as a, as a help to the elders, or is it just a whole new idea? And whichever one, I will say that when the church is at peace among themselves, the elders will be grateful and, and have joy in that. Um, like we know, Paul said he found his joy in the joy of the church, the Thessalonians. Back earlier in the letter in chapter 2, 19 and 20, he said, What is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. So, kind of like a father with his kids, if there's always bickering and fighting and strife in the home, um, that's not going to make a glad father. um, And it's not going to make glad children either. And so, in the church, if there's always bickering and strife and contention, that's just going to be an unhappy mess. Proverbs says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. So again, continuing that thought of like, in love... Not only esteem your elders, but esteem one another. Uh, Be at peace among yourselves. Picture two toddlers fighting over a toy in the nursery. There's literally like 20 perfectly good toys, but they both decide, I want this toy. And they latch on and they're not going to let go. We've all seen that. It's ugly. We do it as adults, but not over a toy. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Why not give? Just here, you can have it. I'll find something else. How good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Uh, It's blessed, more blessed to give than to receive. So, like, give others their preference. Yeah, there are things that, like, there must be, um, you know, good dispute over. You know, if false teaching is being taught, like, we're not just supposed to say, oh, I'll just give them the benefit of the doubt. Like, no, but when it comes to these, like, preference things, these um, non-sin issue things, just... See what happens. Give your brother or sister their preference and seek your joy and their joy like like Paul did. You know, let let their joy with whatever they desire be your joy and you will have peace among yourselves. Okay. Um, So the charge is this. Notice those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and know them. Notice them. um, And and esteem them very highly in love because of their work, and be at peace among yourselves. Let me close in prayer. <clears throat> Jesus, I thank you that you have given to your church these, these elders, these shepherds, these pastors, um, these overseers, to help your flock, to feed us, to keep us um, protected from wolves, to show us the way we should go. Um, we thank you for these, these men, and we pray for more gifts of this kind among us. Um, 
he wanted 70 men to be the elders of Israel, and so I know there's good in a multiplicity of elders, and so I pray that you would even raise up more um, among us to, to share this burden and to do this good work. Help us to esteem all of them very highly in love. Help us to notice those who are doing these things because of their um, the gifting and desire you've given them. And um, yeah, we pray that you would help us do this for the for the glory of your name and the health of your church and help us to be at peace among ourselves. We pray this in your name, amen. All right, please stand and join us uh, for our final song. So let me Thank you, Marshall, for sharing the word this morning. I'll end with this. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. May God bless you as you make your way to Camp of the Woods. Lunch will start at 1230. And don't forget your food to share with everyone else. God bless. We'll see you in a bit.